Okay, we're going to start. Good morning, everybody. My name is Sarah Eisen. Uh, I'm an anchor of Closing Bell on CNBC, and I'm very excited to be here this morning um, to talk about mass data and mass insights, especially because I interview all these people. I have them on my show. They're all CEOs of big companies, and we never talk about this topic on TV. Maybe we should, but it just doesn't get into the, the earnings and economic discussion. But after doing some prep calls and speaking to these folks, it's clear that this is front and center issue for business and society, and, and not just for their own businesses, but really to help solve some of the biggest problems that we're all talking about at WEF, geopolitics, economics, climate. We're, we're going to solve it all here in the next 40 minutes. So I'm honored to be here and to welcome our distinguished panel. We've got Francis D'Souza, who's the CEO of Illumina, Laura Alber, who is the CEO of Williams Sonoma, Antonio Neri, who's the CEO of Hewlett Packard Enterprise, and Christian Klein, who is the CEO of SAP. So we've covered a lot of industries, and we're going to hear about how you're using data and how we can all use data in a, in a better way. And, and you know, Antonio, it's something, it's a Davos topic, big data, that, that has been around for a while. But I feel like it was always this pie in the sky, future opportunity, the promise of data. It's going to solve all our problems. We're there. Yeah. We ha we have, you're yeah. using the data. So yeah. are we going to fix it all? <laughs> we try. Yeah. And, but we need to go further and faster. So that's the point. So good morning, everyone. Um, so if you think about the journey we are on, I mean, the topic here at Davos has been consistent digital transformation. The digital transformation at the core is basically making the enterprise and the society way more efficient and more inclusive. But when you think about that, we live in a digital economy, we are creating an enormous amount of data. I think the, uh, the decade of the 2010 to the 2020 has been a decade of the information area. Through that journey, to that transformation, uh, we created an enormous amount of data. I think if you think about the extrapolation of that data and other challenges with sustainability, Think about carbon footprint. I think about carbon footprint to host this data. But the data can be also used to solve the carbon footprint. So in many ways, I think we are enter in the 2020 what I call the new age of insights, where with the tools that have emerged with supercomputing, AI, machine learning, we have an ability to actually use that data to solve some of the biggest societal problems. So let's talk, let's, let's talk about that. Climate being one, yeah. obviously. Energy transition being another one. Healthcare, uh, transportation. So there is a lot of societal problems we can tackle now with the tools we never had before. And as I think about the hyper-connected world, we have an opportunity also to make the world more inclusive and so that people can participate. So this is the opportunity to really act fast and there is many, many use cases we can go and discuss yeah. today. No, I, I, I want to do that because it, that all sounds really good, but I'm wondering how it works. So, Francis, how, how is data going to help us live longer and live healthier? It's a great question. And I think we're entering this, this golden era where, uh, you know, biology is going through its own digital transformation. We have more and more tools that digitize aspects of biology. So. Uh, at Illumina, for example, we make the machines that do genomic sequencing. So you put in blood or saliva or plant material, and we'll tell you uh, the <coughs> DNA or the RNA in that sample. And there are a whole set of use cases uh, after you digitize you know, the, the data. And I'll give you a couple. Uh, one was during COVID. So we were called into China in the fall of 2020, late 2020, uh, sorry, 2019, <laughs> to help them diagnose what was then a flu of unknown origin. And so we did the first sequence of the SARS-CoV-2 genome. That was published on January 10th. And around the world, what happened was uh, a couple of companies, so Moderna in Cambridge and, and BioNTech in, in Germany, took that data and started working on their vaccine. Now, what's interesting is that Moderna, for example, has never had the live virus on their site. It was all a software problem from them. I remember talking to Stefan, and he was saying, look, we're basing our entire vaccine program on that data you published. It better be good data, because that's it. That's all we're using. And, uh, and you can get a sense that Moderna is one of, arguably you know, one of the most uh, you know, uh, in one of the more important companies in biology right now, and yet it's all a software problem for them. And so that's a use case of once you digitize biology, you can solve profound biological problems. Another it's a good example, thing you got it right. It's a good thing. Yeah. It's a good thing. Um, another example and, is... And, and who knew you're actually responsible for the COVID vaccine that we all have? <laughs> Moderna did yeah. all the work. <laughs> um, and so did BioNTech. Um, but another example is what we're doing in cancer, in cancer early detection. So. 
Uh, here, the, the way this, the story plays out is we at Illumina, we're running a service for pregnant mothers where we have a test, a non-invasive prenatal test, to assess the health of the, the, the baby in the first trimester. We were running that test and we noticed that the fetal DNA was normal, but the mother's DNA was not. And so we reported it to the doctor saying something's wrong with the maternal DNA, are the moms okay? And the doctors came back to us and said, in all cases, the moms seem healthy, but we'll stay in touch with them. And, and what they found in all of those cases was that the moms went on to discover they had cancer. And so we, I remember, I still get goosebumps thinking about it, but I remember we thinking, like, shoot, we're seeing signals of cancer in the blood. And so we ran you know, uh, some of the largest studies ever run in cancer, over 300,000 samples across different studies, and ran three experiments. The first experiment was we were looking for known cancer mutations, you know, BRCA, KRAS, EGFR, in the blood samples, and said maybe that's what tells you. Second one was we looked for uh, mut uh, distortions in the genome, heavily mutations, wrong number of chromosomes, and said maybe that's what tells you. But the third experiment we ran was only because uh, the guy who runs research for us has not only an MD from Stanford, but he has a PhD from Stanford in AI, so he's an AI wonk. And so he said, look, I want to run an, an unbiased experiment here. Let the machines go, and let's do AI learning and see what is the best biomarker. And the machines beat the world's best by orders of magnitude. So we're like, well, what are they looking for that tells you that somebody has cancer? And it turns out we still don't understand why, but the hmm. machines identified these methylation signatures, these very complicated methylation signatures in the blood, that tell you you have cancer right now. So if you have cancer, those methylation signatures show up. And so we launched 18 months ago a blood test, uh, the Grail Gallery test, that can tell you if you have one of 50 types of cancer, stage one to stage four. And first of its kind, truly life-changing. Um, but it's an example of the fact yeah. that this would never have happened without the big data and then the machine learning, AI because we just don't un even understand the biology of why this works. I mean, it's, it's amazing. We could do a whole panel just on, on that. Um, and, and we'll talk more about it. But Christian would love to hear from you. You're a wealth of data, right? This is what you do for your customers. What, what, what's different and what, what are you trying to, to, how do you apply value to all that data? Yeah, that's a good question, Saiwan. Look, um, we at SAP, of course, we also ask ourselves, uh, what can our technology do about all the challenges we are discussing here at the WEF? And uh, again, this year, um, we are talking a lot about resilient supply chains. And, you know, because it's actually um, jeopardizing <coughs> our quotes. And uh, second um, is, of course, uh, every CEO I'm talking here to has really no clue what is happening on scopes we with, with regard to carbon emissions. And, but the problem is 80% of the carbon emissions are exactly there. So think about it. You know, so for example, Antonio and I, the companies are great partners. And now the last decade, we spent a lot of time. Partners or competitors? Partners. 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 Mm. I said partners, so I yeah. said partners. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are good partners. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, no, think about it. Uh, the last decade, we spent a lot about creating big data lakes and, you know, working on predictive analytics. And look how great some industries, you know, really developed and what we can do in the healthcare industry. But now, talking about supply so, well, chains. I, need, I know you want to talk let's, about supply chains. Let's collaborate <laughs> and share data. Yeah, when, when Antonio and we are sharing data, I know exactly can he really deliver the hardware I need to run my cloud business. If he cannot deliver, I have a big problem. Now let's assume we are bringing his suppliers also to the same platform. And now we are all sharing data down to the raw material. And suddenly I see what is happening across the supply chain. And this is about data collaboration. And this is where we are building a huge network where we are connecting, for example, the automotive industry from a Volkswagen, from a Toyota, from General Motors, down to the raw material. And suddenly you see how is the demand changing and how, what the supply is needed. And are there disruptions in the supply chain to really react much faster to some of the disruptions we have seen in the last two years. And now once more, one more, when we talk about sustainability, once you have this end-to-end -end transparency and you're gonna share material data, why not use the standard with the big four and put a standard in for ESG, for carbon? And now suddenly we talk all about the same carbon data. Mm. We really put a standard in place. And again, we are sharing data. And suddenly we also have data from scope three. And suddenly an enterprise can take real action, conscious decisions on not how to only create resilient supply chains, but also sustainable supply chains. And this is where technology can help, where we can build bridges, and that's where we it, It's not a competitive edge, your data, like you're fine sharing it with him? No, at the end of the day, we are anyway sharing data. 
when we are actually procuring great products, actually we are sharing the data what we need about the products what we need and so the material is anyway going to be shared and now we just need to come together on this platform and really build this supply hmm. chain and this uh, end to end transparency Laura you're not going to share data with uh, your consumer data with restoration hardware are you <laughs> <laughs> nice question Sarah <laughs> Thanks. you use a ton you use a ton of data <laughs> we do talk to us about how it gives you an edge in, in the business absolutely so you know we're over 65 percent e-commerce I don't know if people, people know that and um, before e-commerce became a thing we mailed catalogs and you may all remember the Williamson of Pottery Barn, what, you know, West Elm catalogs. We mail, some brands now have no catalogs. But the beginning of the data science for us was about who to mail the catalog to. And then it became what cover do you react best to. And now that we've transitioned online, there's so many uses of that data. And yet, at the same time, when I bring this up, I'm sure some of you think, well, that's super creepy. And why would I want to have you know that? You're going to just oversell me. Well, the truth is, it's relevant, right? So let me give you the most extreme case, and then we can you know, make it more simple. I mean, the, the, the reality is furnishing a home is not easy. Dimensional, things are hard to deliver. They're hard to put in your house. They're hard to remove from your house. And oftentimes, I'm sure how many of you have done a project? Somebody, everybody? <laughs> you make a mistake. The biggest mistake is you buy too much furniture. It does not fit. Now imagine. If I can tell you what things go together, not because I have good taste, but because I have seen combinations and patterns of products that work perfectly together in your type of home, which happens to be a craftsman, you know, in, and, and you have a red dining room. I know you have a red dining room, and I'm going to show you exactly three choices that are most successful in that kind of space. Now, I'll take it further and have a room planner that's 3D. And I can put into that, there's, designers have tricks, right? Like anybody who does anything for a long time, you know how not to make the mistake of the over furnishing. You know that even though the room is 10 by 10, there's a door there. So you're not going to put the chair next to the door because it's going to open and hit the door. But when you look at it on a schematic, you might think that's OK. So how do you take an online tool, a room planner, and show danger, danger, don't put the furniture doesn't fit because of the door or the window or this or that. We're using all that. We're using a lot of data from consumers and successful designs to help you design your room, if you would like that. If you come in and say, we have free design services. It's not an infomercial. Don't worry. And you come in and you say, I would like you to help me with my living room. I say, let me come to your house. We measure. We do all that. And then I'm going to show you all these options I'm going to put into a room planner. And I am going to use some of this data based on what others have used. That's the most extreme case. The, the simpler thing is just simple emails. You've opted in. We have first party data. I mean, the challenge of the third party data we have solved because we have you know, um, our own <coughs> loyalty program, our own credit card. But what you, if you're a baker, you might, not be a, you might not cook savory. You just want baking stuff. And so why should I send you all this? all these emails about something you're not interested in. It's annoying. But it's actually quite interesting to get an email on something you're interested in. right? I'm fascinated by what you do. I'd rather talk about what you do. And I want all the information on that test. I want everything. <laughs> like I got my I actually took the test. And I got my results, but I don't have enough information. But that's an opt-in. Mm -hmm. So if I want information about how to cook souffles, and I'm going to master that. Please, I don't get those emails. Please. <laughs> you know, Please tell me. So that's how we think about it, because my job is to serve the consumer. But there is a line, right? I mean, in terms of it is a little creepy when, and I'm not, I'm not singling you out, but, but brand, retailers know like that I recently had a baby, and so they're soliciting me on baby bottles. or, or There's a fi There is a fine line. And you I have, guess it works, yeah. but, but there's a little bit of an invasion feeling. So how do you, you deal with that? You have to make your own rules about those things. If you want to come on and sign up and register with us, that's one thing. But we are very careful not to use this extra data that you can get outside. We do do new mover. Well, that seems like a pretty benign thing. Post office information, you signed up, change of address. Now I'm going to send you something that says, want me to decorate your house. 
less creepy than the baby. Sure. Judgment on my part, <laughs> right? But consumers also give us a lot of feedback. So we, we try to do what they want and not just optimize for sales. Francis, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's an issue for you too, right? With healthcare, very personal data. And I was curious when you use the China example, first of all, are they sharing data with you now on their current wave? So the way it works is our customers keep the data on their site. So they buy machines from us and then they store the data themselves. So we don't actually have access to our customers' data. Uh, they can store it on their own site. But wouldn't it be useful if you did? Because then you could make your technology better? There are, uh, yeah, there are actual service providers. Like Just Aid, for example, has emerged as one of the heroes of the pandemic. What it is is a, uh, it's a, it's a website basically that's run by a very small team where everybody around the world, I think over 200 countries and territories, have uploaded genomes. And so, I mean, you know, we donate a lot of sequencers through countries in Africa and Southeast Asia to give countries the capability to do sequencing of the genomes. And then this, this, this group, JustAid, opened up a website so everybody could upload their data there. And the whole world then yeah. can track emerging variants and, and so on. And so that's where they store it. They don't store it at, at Illumina, but they store it at JustAid, for example. There's another, uh, there's another piece of infrastructure around influenza virus and tracking the evolution of the virus. And so there are specialized places where people go to store certain kinds of data. But we don't know like, if there are variants coming out of China now. Are you, is anyone sequencing that? You'd have to look in Jusei to see what's published. So we don't get to see that data. It's in the Jusei data that's published you know, publicly for everyone to see. Yeah, I mean, kind of Antonio gets into this question, right, of data sharing is good, right? Yeah, is I, it? I actually don't think about data sharing. I think oh. about sharing insights. Data is proprietary, it's yours, personal. Right. Obviously, um, there is all sorts of data. Laura talked about the data that she uses. Christian talk about data more in the transaction supply chain business. He talk about healthcare type of data and you know and so forth. I mean, if you think about what Francis talk about, and we actually help a lot of companies accelerate the gene the gene research because in the end you need supercomputer capacity and you need sustainable supercomputer capacity. Uh, but ultimately, there is this evolution that. You don't have to centralize everything. In fact, you can actually work in a distributed environment, and we have now AI technologies like we call it swarm learning, where basically the processes happen where the data is stored, but insights is being shared. And what I see an opportunity in the future is create ecosystems where vertical industries can work together, where insights are being shared. And for example, in the case of Gino, that's a great example where obviously they will be able to share those insights to search to accelerate the research. A great example here in, in Germany, we work with an entity called DZNE. DZNE is focused on finding the cure for Alzheimer and dementia. And what they have done is sign up 30,000 citizens that they're willing to basically take a brain of the scan, um, and a scan of the brain uh, every year. And then we are helping them through these swarm learning technologies and AI technologies basically map the, the brain neurons so that we can pinpoint the proteins that they are needed to solve that problem. And in fact, by 2027, we'll be able to do that. So that's a great example of applying sustainable supercomputing distributed capacity. Think about the tools with AI and machine learning techniques. Make sure the data is protected, but share the insights to advance cure in that specific case. That's one example. Yeah, right? no, I and mean, there's many others. When I, when I walked into the green room this morning, I said to them, like, aren't we actually talking about AI? We should have named the, we should have named the panel that. It's a lot mm -hmm. sexier. But so that's the next step in all this, yeah, right? Exactly. That's where we're going. Is, is, is executing against that data, but also do it not just sustainably, but doing it in a collaborative way but also maintaining the privacy of the data but focus on insights. That's a tall task. But How do we so, do that? Everyone I mean, becomes SAP customers. <laughs> <laughs> Not bad. No, uh, no. Uh, seriously spoken, um, look, um, data sharing, Sarah, uh, is actually, you, you are touching on a very important point. I give you an example. Um, when we brought the automotive industry together, I had many CEOs in the room and I said, hey, when we're gonna all share data, you're gonna see and you have this resilient supply chain. You wouldn't imagine, the hardest point was not to get a technology up and running. The hardest point was to convince them that their business model is not getting disrupted when they share their data. Right. And then we came to a point where they said, oh, there is only a win-win for everyone here because we're going to share the data anyway when we procure our stuff with each other and buy the stuff with each other. 
And you need to, you need to give the, the people this win-win situation, the companies this win-win situation. Another example is we built a Corona Warn app in Germany. Uh, and uh, digital in Germany, we are not so much advanced, but this is a very good example and a big discussion in the public. So in the meantime, 45 million Germans are using it. It's a tracing app, it's Bluetooth. So whenever you're gonna meet a person who gets a positive test, you get a warning signal and you said you better stay at home because you met someone who was close enough so that you could be infected. The discussion we had to share data in an anonymous way was, was unbelievable. In a situation like that where we can save life with technology. But next day we share all of our data on social media and I said, hey, Look, uh, in such a situation, can we please come together as a country? And then I went to um, Ursula von der Leyen and I said, Mrs. von der Leyen, why can we not do this in the European Union? Because maybe even in COVID, people travel from Germany to Austria. Would it not be great if we can you know, use the same technology there? There's something about like government tracking. Unbelievable heart, unbelievable okay. heart. And this is where we need to learn that we need to you know, create, get this friction out and trust, trust the technology, but of course also have this opt-in. Everyone you know, can decide you know, if she or he wants to participate, but let's get this friction out and you know, let the, the data flow and then still everyone of course on the consumer side can, design, uh, can decide and opt-in and opt-out. Let me add a different uh, approach we're trying to. Instead of sharing data, uh, in some use cases, we're allowing customers to share the question, and I'll give you where that's helpful. Uh, one of the, the places people use our, our machines are in uh, children's hospitals for babies in the NICU that have genetic diseases. And, you know, they'll do a whole genome sequence to diagnose the child. The challenge is sometimes, you know, the child might have a disease that has only seven other people in the world who've ever had it. And so the odds of you in that hospital having that other patient is almost zero. But, you know, you want to make sure that you're not opening up your data for the whole world to search. And so we're providing tools so you can federate the question. You can say, I have a baby here that has you know, these, this phenotype, seizures, that are, and this genome, you know, these variants, has anybody seen it? And so you can federate that question to children's hospitals around the world, and they, they can respond only if they have. You know, and so you don't, it's not like all these hospitals are sharing their data, they're just making, them, making themselves available for the question, and then they can say, then they can, the, the hospital can talk to, you know, the parents of the, of the child they have to say, okay, somebody has, in San Diego is asking a question, it looks like they have the same genetic disease as your child, is it okay? Do you want to be connected to them or not? And so in this case, it's more about federating the question and doing federated queries and still keeping the data yourself. And that's the example I was trying to, to portray early on is the swarm learning, mm -hmm. understanding. You're not moving the data. You're just yeah. either probing the data with a question or sharing the insight in a much more uh, distributed web that's centralized. Christian brought up social media. I'm curious what you guys think about how they use data. They're not here to defend themselves, so we can trash talk. <laughs> but um, there's been a lot of controversy about them having a lot of our personal intimate data and, and using it against us to sell product. Is that a bad thing, Antonio? You know, this is a, a very difficult topic. Uh, personally, you know, uh, when I think about social media, right, I, I used to communicate what is relevant, not to basically share my entire life and, and the like. Uh, so this is a combination of responsibilities, how you use these tools and how you regulate those tools uh, as you think about the future of uh, how we conduct ourselves. I, I think it's, it's, it's a tricky balance, right? It's mm -hmm. an incredible tricky balance. And I think this is where another element of the web here, which I think is something that has tremendous value, is bringing the public and the private sector together yeah. to discuss these issues. Because the fact of the matter is that the public sector, generally speaking, is tend to follow behind these issues. And they need help and they need education. And we need to come with solutions from the private side to be able to self-sustain some of these challenges over time. Yeah. Uh, you know, my personal view, I think sometimes, and I have kids myself, and I see that, uh, is a, in my view, is a step too far. You know, and you can see kids, these generations, are totally distracted, are not focused. Last night, I had a conversation with my daughter. She's uh, in the last semester in, in college, and she said to me that I just put a timer on my phone, only 15 minutes a day. What that means, it means I'm not going to Instagram anymore. 
not sharing my stories. So there is a, some, you know, was my daughter, but there is a movement that people start rethinking. <laughs> is she going to TikTok instead? No, it's yeah. nothing, <laughs> nothing, okay. uh, nothing. <laughs> Laura, do you advertise on these, these platforms? Maybe it's useful. Maybe it's a good thing that they have all we this do, data. I have very mixed thoughts about it. I mean, I guess on the one hand, you know, forever there's been things that we like that we know are not good for us, mm -hmm. right? And you get the warning, and you're an adult, and you make a choice. I think the difference here is it's not entirely clear all the problems, and you've got children, lots of access, and lots of, you know, bad actors involved. That's right. So, uh, you know, but how much do you want to regulate everything? It's a really difficult question. Um, you know, so I'm totally guilty of being on these sites. Same. Under the heading of, I need to understand this, I'm a retailer. <laughs> but, you know, you're in the rabbit hole, you're, you're looking at all these things that are a waste of time. You know, but I'm an adult. So um, I think we have to be very careful about what we're doing and aware and teach our children and there needs to be a lot more education um, I think for the kids the youth um, that's the only solution I can come up with it's not going away yeah. no. right in terms of other better uses of this conversation uh, this uh, you know subject of lots of data supply chain is a, a yeah. good one you know chain of custody <coughs> It's not easy. You know, we're one of the <coughs> most sustainable home companies. We're the only one that makes the Bloomberg list. We get a lot of credit for it. <coughs> you know, it's still super hard to know exactly where the wood is from. So you buy sustainable wood. Is it? Have we checked every single person that sold every single thing? This supply chain um, <coughs> tracking is, is a really important piece that I'd love to see more development on. There's some. We're trying to really stay on top of what are all the choices, what are all the options to really have that information. So as we try to reduce our, our carbon footprint yeah. and also make sure that there's no social issues with anything that we make, this would really help us um, make sure that it is what <coughs> we think it is. <laughs> um, so I, I put that out there because I, I wish more people were working on that. I mean, you said you could think of all sorts of ways, solutions, but the truth is it's really hard to really do it. I mean, academically, yes. UPCs, RFID, all, you know, like all those mm -hmm. things would work. Yes, I understand. But how do you make sure it actually stays on in the different places that that too isn't fraudulent? Um, and I, I like the idea of throwing down the gauntlet to say to my competition, beat me at sustainability. I'm happy to share all my data, tell you everything we do. You know, that's where all boats rise is if we share data on subjects that are very difficult, on, you know, it's, it's, it's more, I think, more difficult with health data, but, you know, one could say I shouldn't tell who my most green supplier is. But on the other hand, maybe I should. So that's not happening. It's, well, people are competitive. A lot of these people have limited production anyway, but um, there's not as much uh, sharing of information amongst competitors in the retail business on those things, and I think it's a really important subject. And for some reason, everyone sees it as very competitive, or it's not the most important thing to talk about. It is here at the World Economic Forum, yeah. right, Christian? Sure. You, you've done a ton of work on this issue of sustainability and yeah, for sure. how, how companies get better at it through tech. But, but for sure, I mean, look, this is a good point. Um, coming back to my point early on, why would you share this data? Where, is, where can I win in this? And um, I guess it's also very important that you're gonna share with all of the suppliers coming and share this, their sustainability data that maybe they can also find more buyers because you know maybe I supply my product today to one big automotive company and now there are suddenly there, there are hundreds of them. And so I guess you, you have to create this understanding and you have to create also this win-win situations. And coming back maybe because I find the social media is very important because mm -hmm. a lot of enterprises also you know, collecting data from social media. And then on social media, I guess it's a very powerful marketing and sales platform. And you know, if I would want a business, like I would be definitely on this platform. But I guess what is very important is that we're also educating our kids and our children yeah. about you know, how to use these platforms and you know, how you get informed and how the algorithms are working. I mean, I sometimes like to, 
watch you in TV and get a broader perspective because when I only get informed via social media, maybe I get this perspective, but I need this perspective. Yeah, you get a lot get of really negative perspective. Exactly. You'll learn this how people well. feel about your hair. And this is, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and a lot of other things, but we can talk about that offline. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, uh, no, and again, this is really important that we educate. And because I'm also, you cannot regulate everything. Yeah. yeah? But education, especially of our kids, and our children is very important. Okay, so everyone's kind of talking around the, the, the whole public sector role here. Um, also not here, so they can be trash talk. Uh, um, no, but seriously, what, what's the approach? I mean, we can talk like GDPR is in, in Europe, broadly speaking. Let me add where, maybe a couple oh, of please. problems where I think the yeah, public sector. Ahead. So in, in healthcare, uh, there are some, some definitely some of the challenges we talked about. In addition, there are some more, and I think the public sector can play mm -hmm. a bigger role. So I'll list very quickly for them. The first one is in biology, we need the ability to generate a lot more data. So we're still in the process of digitizing biology and we need an immense power, you know, uh, and so we just continue to launch, you know, bigger and bigger sequencers. We've taken prices of sequencing down from $150,000 a genome to $200 a genome, so reduced our prices by over 99%. We need to give people, we need to democratize access to generate huge amounts of data, and that's still gonna require a lot of innovation, that's one. Two, we need to be able to store this, the ginormous amounts of data that are coming out, and there's a huge concern about today's compute and storage technologies just won't scale. And so, for mm. example, we're working with Microsoft and companies like Twist to store IT data in DNA, to say, look, there's no, because today's media will not scale if you think about how much biological data we're gonna generate, and so we need, you know, uh, storage media that can scale many, many orders of magnitude more. There are a couple of other areas that public sector can play a bigger role. One is in equity, and, and in, I'll give you a specific example. Today, uh, most of the genomic data in the world is Caucasian data. The, uh, African ancestral data represents only 2% of the genomic data in the world, whereas it's 17% of the world's population. That is a giant problem because that's the data sets that are being used to create diagnostics, therapeutics. What that means is we are at the risk of institutionalizing racism for decades in the medicines we create, in the diagnostics we do. And so we need the public sector involvement to create population sequencing programs that generate more diverse data. So programs like all of us in the US or Singapore's precise program are very, very important. So we need more equity in the data and that's urgent. Because that's on the government to do? Yeah, not, because- Not you guys? The government generates the program. So the way we got the data is the government does population programs and generates the data sets but they've skewed the data sets to the highly represented population. So in the US, for example, our data sets are vastly Caucasian, and that's a problem. And so we need the government, now the US government has started with the All of Us program to make 85% of the data in that set to come from historically underrepresented you know, programs. So they're catching on that they've created hmm. a problem, and we need more active involvement from outside the world. So one is an equity issue around uh, representation in the data sets. And the next one is global policies around what happens when people share data. What I mean by that is, uh, you saw this in COVID, you know, uh, there was fantastic work done in South Africa to identify uh, an emerging variant. Variants. And in fact, it was a variant that was already circulating in Europe. Which, but, by the way, hurt them because then everyone banned travel. That's exactly what happened. Yeah. Botswana and South Africa were the pioneers in reporting it. And what happened is the U.S., Europe all slapped on travel bans right before Christmas, right before the peak tourism se season, and really hurt those economies. Yeah. And so we need to flip our thing and say we need the public sector to create policies that encourage, not disincent sharing. When somebody reports something like that, instead of punishing them, we should have a surge in funding to say, hey, you guys need help, or a surge in vaccines, or a surge in diagnostic tools. We need to change the mindset that says we're gonna punish people who share data and we need to encourage them. What they need at that point is not punishment, they need help. And so there's public sector work around policy, there's public sector work around representation, and then there's technology work around generate more data and be able to store, store that data. Antonio, what else do we need the government to do here? Again, I agree with Francis. It's been more on the positive enforcement versus the negative constraint, I would mm. say, right? I mean, if you take uh, another example, transportation, as we go forward with uh, electrification and, 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 and autonomous driving, one of the challenges we're gonna have is how we drive safety. And infrastructure, weather, sharing information is gonna be uh, critical. But there's also opportunity to create business models out of that. So for example, uh, we know everybody's gonna develop their own proprietary system to basically drive autonomous uh, cars. And for example, one of the great examples we, we are working on right now is that the fact that if Mercedes creates a proprietary kind of set of insights, but then BMW has a different one, they can't communicate. However, 
we can use technologies like blockchain to commercialize mm -hmm. that insight and share it. Sara is uh, you know, ahead of me and said, listen, Antonio, you're behind. There is going to be a black eyes. Be, be careful. You can monetize that by sharing that insight and, and transact it in a very secure and, uh, and, and, and it's kind of like that, isn't that sort of what Waze does, like in Google a little bit? But, but the not yet in the services layer of the, the autonomous driving side. So, right. But that's what I said, you know, there will be other services that the government will have to provide and facilitate with regulatory uh, kind of approach. Now, on the other side, on the technology, I can tell you, Francis, we have technologies today to solve and store that data. We just last year, we brought for the first time in humankind the exaflop capability that allows us to process now one quintillion transactions per second. So think about it, what it used to take before, weeks and months to maybe years to find the vaccine. Now we can do it potentially in days. So how we use this technology in the broader ecosystem to solve some of these challenges yeah. with the government? Yes, ex but the government on technology, like. So, I don't know, a week ago, the FAA systems went out or something happened where 10,000 flights were canceled because the FAA just like couldn't figure it out. Yeah. So they don't even have, why, why can't you give them the data to we work can. that out? We can, but it's unbelievable complex. And, you know, in Europe, you know, a tech company, a startup, definitely doesn't have equal opportunities when you work on AI and like you create a startup in the United States yeah, because we have something like, we call it the Datenschutzgrundverordnung, like the data security, it's extremely complex thing. But you know, at the end you cannot train your algorithms as you could if you could if you would create your startup in the United States. And we need global because of regulation. policies of regulation. This is why we need global policies. And these global policies should also consider, of course, equal opportunities, but also diversity, yeah, that not you know, one or the other community is getting disadvantaged. And there we need to get, you know, to come together, but we don't even come to this point in Europe. Why now, doesn't Europe you, want to foster a, a yeah, Because a the big European tech Union is not one union when it comes to uh, digital transformation. I mean, every country makes their own sovereign cloud. When I talk to President Macron and to President Scholz, I said, why do we need two? One in Paris and one in France. Do one, it's better. Who, it's who, more cost effective, it? it's better. <laughs> yeah, the data flows <laughs> and we come to one regulation. Uh, it's better for everyone here around the table. Maybe I would even make more money, but at the end of the day, <laughs> it just makes no sense. And this is where you know, we need to also ask the public sector to create more of these global policies, when in the, especially in the world where everyone moves a little bit backwards on globalization. But it's interesting because it, it seems from the outside that the U.S. doesn't have any data protections or privacy or regulations around this and that Europe does and maybe, and that's thought of as a, as a good thing. But is that a bad thing? Uh, um, <laughs> Look, uh, at the end, uh, our customers really value and we have technology for that exactly to, you know, first of all, they want to understand also the clients in the U.S. Where do we store our data? Where do we locate? Consumers want to opt in and opt out. This is very important. And, but again, you know, definitely we have higher regulations in Europe, that's true. And you know, a common standard, as ever absolutely is, is, would be absolutely important and would make things easier for consumers, for enterprises, and as well also for the public sector. Laura, you, I mean, this affects you, right? We, we've, we've actually, I feel like we talked about it maybe earlier in the week, the whole, the data, the fact that companies are going at it, like Apple, regulation, regulating it themselves, that governments are going at it. How does this impact you and what are your thoughts about what, what kind of regulations we've, we've seen or should see? Mm -hmm. I think um, you know, the big change was the cookie, cookie list situation. And how do you, you know, there's a lot of people who consult about what to do. Um, you know, we, if, you, if you have the customer relationship yourself, it's a lot easier. And that's what we've been building for years. And because we have stores too, there's a lot more trust versus just a new, you know, a new brand that you don't know. But you know the loyalty programs, um, the opt-ins on our site help us. And then there's you know there's what you can do, and there's then what we choose to do. And so our our um, operating principle is to to really help the customer make a better decision. And you know the best day is when you buy great stuff. <laughs> when you go sh when you're looking and you're going shopping for clothing, clothing, it's a failure if you come out with nothing, right? How how great is it if you need something to be able to buy something that you love? And so you know, it may sound shallow, but on the other hand, it's really a big part of what we all do. And if we can do a better job 
furnishing your home and getting you the things you need and not giving you the things you don't need and the things are going to last a lifetime and they're made sustainably, I feel very fulfilled by that. And so we use the data for that. For example, you know, auto recommendation tools um, on checkout are very common. And a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of tech companies sell that tool. And we had the leading tool from someone else that we used. And our team in their test kitchen, which is what we call our experimentation lab, built. And they said, we're going to beat this tool and we're going to turn the other one off. And then we might sell it to some other people. And we did. We built it so we can see, we, we know based on all of our data, if you buy this, you're most likely to buy this. This is a good thing to buy with that. Um, you don't have to, but if you, you'll see it. It'll say, you may also like. It's a very simple thing. And it's extremely helpful. To, and you can see it, you know, also, I think there's some fashion sites that show you, you see the dress and then you see the whole outfit. And it gives you new ideas, like that's a really, you know, the, it's a, a red dress and you're going to wear pink shoes. Like, that. I wouldn't have thought of that. that super cool and different for an important you know, event or something. And so those kinds of things, when you come to the home too, to show people how to mix woods, for example, like you may think all the wood needs to match. Well, the truth is it doesn't. So you may also like this, then I can serve you a picture that has the wood, the two colors shown. So you feel really good about keeping what you already have and then bringing in the, the latest lighter wood that's now in on top of your mid-century cherry or a dark, you know, um, darker wood finish, and I show you how that's, and then you feel really good about doing that because someone else gives you the example. And it's, it's really, um, those are the types of things that I get excited that, that we're working on that I can feel really good about, and it's because we're experts in what we do, and we have trust with our consumers. That's what we strive to do. I always click on the you may also likes, like across the board. I, we have a few more minutes. Um, if anybody has a question in the audience, love to open it up, please. Yeah, um, I want to ask you about public disclosure of, um, of carbon emissions. So uh, Buckhill, we're venture capitalists and, and create, invest in software for measuring supply chains. And last year, I thought came away with optimism that companies were happy that regulations were telling them how to do it and eliminating the confusion. What I'm hearing now is a, is a pullback on scope three. And also, companies since then have disclosed and been beaten up for it, the pioneers. So the question is, do you think it's valuable to disclose? How do you feel about it? Complications, what would you like to see better? I, I just start, absolutely. Mm -hmm. We've disclosed, we've set really aggressive targets. I really hope I can hit them. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna take the risk if I can't, I'm gonna be better off than the person who doesn't try. Mm -hmm. The hardest is scope three. I mean, yeah. it's, it's very different when you're making stuff. You know, I have to convince Maersk to invest in those ships with green energy. Otherwise, I can't get there with my goal. Yeah. That's very simple. Imagine that. Is, can I just ask, is it valuable to your company to do it? Abs yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'll second that by a long shot. Uh, not only is it the right thing to do, but our employees care about it a lot. Our customers, the physicians, the researchers really care. On the research side, they want big science to be green science. And, and, and it's the same thing with our uh, our physician customers, but they also care about it from an accessibility perspective. I'll give you an example. The new product we just are about to launch in the next few weeks eliminated the need for a cold chain, so no dry ice when you ship the reagents. That's fantastic, and we reduce plastic and waste by 90%, and we set very ambitious goals. But the people, when announced it at our, our event when we launched it, a couple of people came to me in tears, and they said, look, that's a big deal, because in our country, it means we can now run sequencing in our country because we don't have a reliable cold chain. Right? And so what started out as a sustainability goal also addresses accessibility, which is if you don't require uh, consistent you know, uh, cold chains, you're now opening up access to you know, this essential healthcare technology to countries around the world that couldn't do it. So I'll say it's, it's important. It's important to our customers. It's important to us as a company. We've set ambitious goals. What we'd like to see from regulations is, and for us, they are sort of the backstop. They're not the high bar. That, we're setting much higher bar for us than, than, than the regulations would, would ask. But what we like is more consistency across everybody asking you to disclose different things, to say, okay, can we have just a, a simpler framework and a more consistent framework so we know what we need to be reporting and how you want it reported? Because right now you have conflicts in how different, you know, different standards are measuring things. And so we want more clarity there, and, and I think that would help everybody. Okay. So, we, 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 um, okay, let's do one and two very quickly. 
But first off, thank Sound you very bites. much. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry. No, no. Um, okay. First off, thank you very much for sharing. Um, <clears throat> it's really exciting um, case studies in particular. Um, for, forgive me if I'm mistaken, but, but I believe, Antonio, you were the only person who used the word insight here. Um, and there's a huge amount of talk about information and data and data sharing and observation and the what that happens. What I drown in at the moment is the ability to translate all the what that surrounds me into a why. And I, mean, I think, Laurie, your point about baking, for example, which I love, that, as a huge fan of West Elm. Um, I want to know why that person's buying the baking stuff. Is it because they want to do cozy? Because then I can cross-sell them all things cozy. Or are they doing baking because they really, really hate their job and they want to retrain <laughs> as a chef? <laughs> but if I understand the why, it helps me to leverage that data better. And in all of this time we've been talking about big data at WEF for so many years, I have never had that answer. It gives me more and more and more what. It never gives me why. And so insight drowns in information. Mm -hmm. Let's give this man a why. <laughs> Somebody. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think, uh, you know, this is where, you know, I, I talk about inside as a ways to answer those fundamental questions, right? Um, you know, uh, the fact of the matter is that there is a, a lot of unanswered questions that we can answer with the tools and the data we have today. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's like, yes, I agree with Francis, we need more data. The fact of the matter is we need more insights, no more data at this point in time. And I think if you think about the just inertia, if you think about just the next two to three years, we're going to generate more data in the next two to three years than the last 2,000 years. Okay? Think about the impact to sustainability on that because the amount of energy to host that data is insane. In fact, there are studies that said maybe 20%, up to 20% of the entire energy consumption will be to store that data. But instead, is how we flip the conversation into applying the great technology we have today with the great research and the great uh, kind of learning experiences and answer those questions. You know, obviously we want to answer the mm -hmm. climate question, we want to answer genomic questions, we want to answer other things. And that's what we as a company do. We help answer those questions through technology and know-how to ultimately deliver value. Because in the end, it's all about delivering business outcomes. What well, Laura talk about is all about delivering value that ultimately returns the value to shareholders, let's be clear, right? But in the context of what you asked early on, uh, it's all good because shareholders are demanding it too. Yeah, and maybe very quickly, I mean, look, uh, in the digital world, consumers have much more choices and enterprises investing a ton of money to understand better the why. Customer loyalty programs give me price correlations, yeah? how to get my renewal retention rates up, how did other consumers decide in a similar situation. There are a lot of patterns, yeah, what enterprises analyze yeah, to come up with better cross-sell and higher retention rates. And maybe last piece on, the, on sustainability. I mean, I've never thought three years ago that we would ever create a business case for an ERP supply chain project based on sustainability. So we always talked about how we can help to grow, how can we help to automate, but now every enterprise is also asking, help me to create this green ledger, help me how I get more visibility about scope three. So the acceptance is absolutely there. Standards are now key and the transparency is key. We're out of time, but Laura, um, do we know why the person wanted to bake? <laughs> <laughs> or we don't know? You just, it just, just matters I, I want to help them achieve their goals. That's my why. Mm -hmm. You know, why they do it. I don't even know if you really know why you do anything. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a perfect way to wrap. Thank you so much. Thank you very much to our panel, and thank you for coming today. Nice to see you. Nice to see you.